two, then almost every graph will be L reconstructable, meaning the fraction of graphs as n goes off to infinity that are L reconstructable will go to one. Uh, with my student Spinoza, we were able to show that in fact, this reconstruction only needs to use L plus two choose two of the n choose L cards. So, uh, and that generalizes uh, old result well known when L equals one, that almost every graph is reconstructable from in fact, any three cards. So I will, I will tell you some about how to do this, um, but what does it mean in terms of these thresholds? Well, some graphs that Mueller constructed sort of algebraically are hard to reconstruct, but when N and L are restricted by N growing at least twice L, then almost all graphs will be L reconstructable. Okay. So how do we go about doing this? Oh, um, before I do that. So the, the theme in this subject is um, so we can't prove this threshold of 2L for all graphs or even any linear uh, threshold, but for special families or special parameters of the graph, we can seek thresholds so that N growing at least linearly in L will imply that that thing is, or that family is L reconstructable. Okay, so let's talk about almost all graphs. The key property we need is that uh, when you take more than half of the vertices, say at least one plus epsilon times half of the vertices, uh, when you take the induced subgraphs with that many vertices, almost every graph will have the property that those subgraphs have no non-trivial automorphisms and they're pairwise non-isomorphic, okay? So we call that being good for these subgraphs. And the theorem we actually prove is that if the subgraphs obtained by deleting L plus one vertices have this property of being good, then G will be reconstructable from some set of L plus two choose two subgraphs obtained by deleting L vertices, deleting one less. Uh, and in fact, there will be many such sets of L plus two choose two subgraphs. And what this means is that again, among N vertex graphs, the fraction that are reconstructable from the subgraphs obtained by deleting one minus epsilon times N over two vertices will tend to one as N tends to infinity. Okay. So again, in the concise language, here's the statement of our theorem that if the N minus L minus one deck is good, then the N minus L deck will determine G. So what I want to do is tell you where we're going to find these L plus two choose two special subgraphs. So let N be the number of vertices in G, fix a set of L plus one vertices. No matter, it doesn't matter what they are, just pick any L plus one vertices. When we delete all L plus one of them, we're left with some subgraph H, which has little h vertices. But I want to make subgraphs where I delete only L vertices. So let me take one of the special vertices and include that along with all of H. So all the ways that I can do that will give me L plus one cards, which I call C1 through CL plus one. Now, those cannot determine the graph because since I only have one of these special vertices in any one of these graphs, only one at a time, I don't learn anything about the edges within S, which edges are there. So in order to do that later, I also include subgraphs where I keep two of the special vertices and throw away one of the vertices down here. So again, these graphs will have the same number of vertices as these, it'll be N minus L. So I'll get L plus one choose two more graphs over here. And the claim is that G will be reconstructable from this set of L plus two choose two cards. And the basic idea, the basic reason for this 
is that this special subgraph H here is going to be the only H vertex subgraph that appears in L plus one cards. It appears in all the cards in C. And any other graph subgraph with the same number of vertices is going to appear in fewer of these cards. That way I'll know what H is. I'll know what all the C sub I's are. I'll know the special vertex in C sub I and I'll know the edges from that vertex to H. So I'll know everything except the edges within S. So proving this claim that H is the only such graph is actually pretty easy. There's a small set of cases depending on how many vertices you use from the special set to show that any other graph will appear fewer times. Uh, any other H vertex subgraph will appear in fewer cards. So I won't worry about the details of that. Then once we have H, we can use it to identify which card is D sub I J and we'll be able, we'll know which vertices are X I and X J in that card and we can check whether they're adjacent. So that's basically how you prove that. Well, let's think about some other parameters of the graph. Um, of interest has been the degree list of the graph and whether or not the graph is connected. So back in 1974 and 1982, so Manvel and Cherniak respectively showed that connectedness and also the degree list are too reconstructable when you have at least six vertices. Okay. Uh, we were able to push this a little farther. Oh, right. Before I say that, the same example that I showed you earlier shows that this result is sharp. These two graphs had five vertices. They have the same three deck, meaning deleting two vertices. One of them is connected and the other one is not, and they have different degree lists. So they show that both of those results are sharp. So as I said, we were able to push this a little farther. Uh, Connectedness and the degree list we showed are three reconstructable when you have at least seven vertices. And again, by the, you know, L reconstructable implies L minus one re reconstructable. This re result implies those up there as long as you check the graphs with six vertices. This result is also sharp. If you look at a five cycle plus an isolated vertex or the tree that you get from K13 by subdividing two edges. And this is a little ambiguous here, subdividing two edges or subdividing one edge twice. We'll see later, it doesn't matter. Those two trees have the same three deck and they have the same three deck as this disconnected graph, which has a different degree list. Okay. Um, what about L in general? So Taylor showed that the degree list is L reconstructable as long as the number of vertices in your graph is at least L times E, roughly E 2.718. And uh, however, that's been improved. So there was a paper this year that uh, appeared on the archive this year by Grunlin, Johnston, Scott, and Tan. And they proved that the degree list is reconstructable when, from the K list when K is pretty small. So the K only needs to be about the square root of 2n log 2n. Well, if we turn that around uh, and, and compare n with n minus K, in other words, L, the number of vertices being deleted, you find that the degree list is L reconstructable as long as L is at least about L plus something on the order of square root of L. So this coefficient E here has been reduced to one in their result. So that's surprising, a very strong result. What about connectedness? Well, Spinoza and I were able to show that there is a threshold for L reconstructability of connectedness, meaning all reconstructions are connected or all reconstructions from the deck are disconnected. And we showed that you can tell that as long as n is at least a ridiculously large number, l to the l plus one squared. 
and Brendan Johnson, Scott and Tan came along this year and they proved that connectedness is L reconstructible as soon as N is at least about 10 L. So, you know, that's much, much stronger than what we had originally proved. Okay, well, what about special families, really special families? It's natural to think when you want to say, well, you know, what L do we need to make a graph L reconstructible? Let's think about the N vertex cycle. So we had some idea of what might be the right answer for uh, the cycle. And along came a problem in the American Mathematical Monthly by Richard Stanley. And Stanley proposed showing that in an N vertex graph whose components are cycles of length greater than K, the number of independent sets of size K would depend only on N and K, not on the arrangement of lengths of the different cycles, as long as all the cycles you use have length greater than K. Stanley proved this using a generating function argument um, and wondered about a combinatorial argument. So we found a combinatorial argument and we were able to generalize the combinatorial argument to prove something much more. So in fact, we proved this theorem that if we had two N vertex graphs with maximum degree two, rather than saying two regular, just maximum degree two, and the number of edges is the same, which just means that the number of components that are paths is the same in the two graphs. Then if every component in each graph is a cycle with more than K vertices, like Stanley was saying, or a path with at least K minus one vertices, then the two graphs have the same K deck, meaning the number of induced subgraphs with K vertices, not just the independent sets, but actually any su induced subgraphs that you want to mention with K vertices, each of these two graphs would have the same number of them. That's what it means for the K deck to be the same. So let's think about some special cases of this statement. One of the things it says is that if you have a cycle, then you can split the vertices into two cycles. As long as each of those two cycles has at least K plus one vertices, you have the same K deck, which means that in order to show that the cycle is reconstructible, uh, K would need to be bigger uh, the, than this value, this, the subgraphs you use. Or if, if you have a long path, you could split off some of the vertices to form a cycle and leave the rest as a path, as long as the cycle has at least K plus one vertices and the path has at least K minus one vertices. Again, these two graphs, one of which is connected and one of which is not, would have the same K deck. And finally, Suppose you have a graph that's a disjoint union of two paths. Well, you could shift a vertex from one path to the other. And it would still have the same K deck as long as all the paths involved have at least K minus one vertices. So in particular, if you look at the path with two L vertices, it will have the same L deck as the graph consisting of a cycle with L plus one and a path with L minus one. And that means that the threshold on the number of vertices in order to have a L reconstructability of the property of connectedness will have to be at least two L plus one, okay? So we have that lower bound. So now coming back to this result, I gave you these three special cases in detail because they're not just special cases. In fact, all we need to do to prove the theorem is to prove these three statements. And why is that? They suffice to prove the theorem because of this nice little lemma that's not too hard to prove, that if you have two graphs, they will have the same K deck if and only if their disjoint union with any other graph that you want has the same K deck, okay? And that enables you to break the comparing of two graphs that have the given conditions 
into a succession of equalities like this. Okay. Now, in fact, what we're gonna do is prove statement three. And statement three enables us to prove two and two enables us to prove one. So I'll give you the details, uh, almost, uh, proving statement three. So we have two graphs. Here we have uh, a path of Q minus one and a path of R in G1. And the second line G2 is a path of Q and a path of R minus one. And we'd like to show that these have the same K deck. Well, when we talk about a K deck, we talk about counting the induced copies of any particular graph H in our graph. Okay, we wanna show that's the same for these two graphs. And the way we're gonna do it is by looking at the graph we get by adding three vertices to connect the two paths. Okay, when we do that, we get the same graph from both of them. Okay, and now what we're gonna do is think about the number of induced copies of H plus an isolated vertex in this new graph where a certain named vertex Z will be the isolated vertex or be an isolated vertex. So anytime you have H plus K1 in this, with Z being the isolated vertex, it means you have H in your original graph G1 that we had. And if this is the isolated vertex, then you have H in the graph G2. So what we want to do is prove that this value counting the copies of H plus K1 where the name vertex C is the isolated vertex is independent of which vertex we name for the isolated vertex as long as Z is far enough away from the ends of the path. Okay. Um, so this is a technical statement of what we're proving. And basically we're just saying if we have a path with n vertices and we, then any linear forest that we wanna look at, then having that linear forest, forest with z, plus Z as an isolated vertex, where Z is one of these vertices W sub H, will always give us the same count as long as H is far enough away from the ends. Okay, so I just wanna tell you a couple of things about the idea here. It's gonna be by induction on the number of vertices in the linear forest that we're looking at. If K is just one, then the linear forest is just an isolated vertex already. And to have this plus an isolated vertex is H, there are gonna be N minus three ways to choose that extra vertex when N is not an endpoint of the path. So this already here, you see why H needs to be far away, far enough away from the endpoints is if H, WH is an endpoint of the path, then there will be only N minus two of these. Well, there will be one more N minus two. So that's the proof when K is one. And for the induction step, what we want to do is compare this quantity that we're looking at to this quantity in a cycle that we get by adding the edge between joining the ends of the path. So when we do that, By symmetry, the number of copies of L plus an isolated vertex in the cycle is going to be an independent of which vertex we name as the isolated vertex. Okay, because it's symmetry, so that's really nice. But that count will omit copies of L in the path that use the two ends because now they are adjacent and they were not in the path. And on the other hand, this count is going to count unwanted subgraphs that use the edge joining the endpoints of the path because that's not even in the path. So all we need to do is say that the count we want is everything we see in the cycle plus the count of subgraphs that were omitted minus the count of subgraphs that we didn't want. And the basic idea is that when you look at the details of this, here we have fewer vertices in the subgraph we're looking at. And in each of those cases, 
the specified vertex is far away from the ends that the induction hypothesis applies. So this one is automatically independent of the isolated vertex. And these, as long as it's far enough from the ends, are also going to be independent of the isolated vertex. And so that's basically how we prove this statement three. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> OK. Um, so as, again, this is what we proved. And again, just reviewing how we use that to prove this statement our special vertex Z, as long as these pieces on the ends have at least K minus one vertices, Z will be far enough away from the ends that the thing we're counting is independent of the specification of Z, and therefore these have the same K there. Okay. And as, um, as I said, three implies two, two implies one, but I'm not gonna talk about the details of that. But let me observe that this theorem that I've told you about only gives a lower bound for how big K needs to be so that our graph with maximum degree two is reconstructable from the K deck. And in fact, we gave the full solution that uh, basically if K is a little bit bigger than that, or anyway, just any bigger than that, then you will be able to do the reconstruction. So basically that if you have a graph with maximum degree two and the two, the largest component has M vertices, next largest has M prime, then K needs to be at least about M over two and also at least M prime. And maybe you have to add one or two to one of those values, but we know all the conditions for when you have to modify it. Um, then you will be reconstructable. So we will know for each graph with maximum degree two, the maximum L such that it's L reconstructable. So let's talk about some other families of graphs. What about regular graphs? So regular graphs, um, well, when the graph is too regular, what I've just told you about is we know all L such that the graph is L reconstructable. And well, I mean, what about ordinary reconstruction? It's really easy that all regular graphs are reconstructable because we can reconstruct the degree list. And then when we look at any card, the missing vertex has to be adjacent to the deficient vertices. Okay, so Boyan Mohar asked us, well, can we say that regular graphs are too reconstructable? Already, it's not so obvious. And we were able to show that three regular graphs are two reconstructable. So that's just the very next step beyond what's up here. Um, and that's not easy. It takes us about 10 lemmas to uh, restrict the properties of a three regular graph that might have uh, a graph not isomorphic to it with the same deck. Eventually, we're, we were able to restrict the property sufficiently that there is no counterexample. So three regular graphs are too reconstructable. Um, Kostochka and I were able to show that our regular graphs, if they're not too connected, they would be R plus one reconstructable. Um, but that's, uh, that's not too hard. But of course, most of the R regular graphs that you're interested in are too connected. What about disconnected graphs. So um, Kelly showed one of the uh, early results that disconnected graphs are reconstructable when we delete one vertex to get each card. So we can generalize this. Kostochka and I showed that with the threshold 2L plus one again, if every component of G has at most N minus L vertices, so before, disconnected meant at most n minus one vertices, right? So this is generalizing that. If every component has at most n minus L vertices, then G will be L reconstructable. Okay. Um, I will show you how to do that. But first let me note that if you ask for just a little bit more, suppose you have 
one component with n minus l plus one vertices, one more. And all the rest of the vertices are isolated. If you know that such graphs are L reconstructible, that will imply the original reconstruction conjecture. So again, you know, some of the things we're talking about are harder than the reconstruction conjecture. Okay, T to prove that statement about reconstructing uh, this guy here, we use a counting level that, um, the idea of it is in the paper by Greenwell and Heminger, and Manvel actually used similar ideas in his 1974 paper. So let me talk about a family of graphs F. An F subgraph of G is an induced subgraph of G that's in the family F. I'm interested in counting the number of subgraphs of G that are induced subgraphs isomorphic to F and the number of copies of F as a maximal F subgraph of G, meaning it is not an induced subgraph of any other F subgraph of G. And let's say that a family is absorbing if every induced F subgraph of G belongs to a unique maximal F subgraph of G, okay? The dilemma that we can prove then is if your family is absorbing for a graph G, we know it's N minus L deck, and we know the number of maximal F subgraphs of G for each F in the family that has at least N minus L vertices, then the number of maximal copies of any graph in the family is going to be determined by the deck for all graphs in the family. This is actually pretty easy to prove by induction on the maximum length of a, sub, a chain of induced subgraphs uh, that are in the family. So meaning F0 is an induced subgraph of F1 and so forth up to FR. Um, because we know the number of maximal copies of all the big ones and smaller ones we know just by looking at the deck, we know the value of R for each subgraph of F. So when R is zero, well, then every copy of F in G is a maximal copy uh, of F in G among the family. And for larger R, we just gather together the copies in G of this particular subgraph F according to the unique maximal H in the family that contains uh, this F, this particular copy of F. So as I said, that's what it means to be an absorbing family. So when you do that, you say, okay, let's count all the subgraphs of G isomorphic to F. Well, they're just grouped by which H is the maximal F subgraph containing this particular copy. When we have a particular H, there are this many of copies of F in it, and we have uh, this many occurrences of H as a maximal F subgraph. When you look at this, any such H is of smaller depth. So we know all the values in this equation except the one we're looking for. So we'll always be able to compute this number for each F in the family. Okay, that's a, a bit of detail, but let's see why these are useful. When N is at least, is bigger than 2L, we, uh, I, I claimed that every n vertex graph having no component with more than n minus l vertices would be l reconstructable. So why is this? Because the connect family of connected graphs is an absorbing family for any graph. What are the maximal connected graphs? They're just the components, okay? So, and, and also we can recognize when all the components have at most n minus l vertices, if n is bigger than 2L, that happens when there's at most one connected card. Okay. And that means that for every connected graph with at least n minus L vertices, there's at most one of them in G as a, as a component. And if there is one, it has n minus L vertices and we see it. So this counting lemma that I've proved for you applies, which means that 
we can determine all the components of G. So we've reconstructed the graph, okay? So that's a very easy proof. The result is sharp because if you take the path with L vertices, take two copies of it and compare it with this graph. Well, again, the result that I told you about on maximum degree two says that these two graphs have the same L deck. And so therefore this graph is not L reconstructable even though the number of vertices is equal to two L and uh, the graphs, the components have N minus L vertices. What about that degree list result that I told you about earlier? If K is at least the maximum degree plus two, then the K deck will determine the degree list. So here, this family of stars with at least three vertices are absorbing an absorbing family for any graph. Uh, notice that if you take a star with two vertices, there are two maximal stars that it lies in. So we have to leave those out. Stars with at least three vertices have a unique center and hence they lie in a unique maximal star. So that's an absorbing family. The vertices just correspond to the maximal stars. There aren't any with more than K vertices because maximum degree plus one would be the maximum number of vertices in a star. So we have all the conditions we need. The counting lemma will tell us the number of maximal stars with degrees bigger than two, at least two. And we still need to know how many vertices of degree zero or one there are. And we can just get equations for that from the number of edges and number of vertices of the graph, which we also know. So those are two easy applications. So what about trees? Mm. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm going a lot more slowly than I planned, uh, but that's okay. Um, Kelly proved that trees with at least three vertices are reconstructible. The original result again about uh, ordinary reconstruction. So what do we know about larger L? Um, well, Giles proved that trees with at least six vertices are too reconstructed. Okay. Um, needle proved that trees, so here are two trees with the same number of vertices, it's two L vertices. I add a pendant vertex at the middle of a path with an odd number of vertices or at one vertex next to the middle. So these are non-isomorphic trees, but they have the same L deck. Needle didn't really prove, uh, he didn't really include a proof of that, but you can prove that using, again, the result about shifting one vertex on the path from one side to the other that I showed you earlier. So that's now fairly easy to prove. Now, when we want to show reconstruction or L reconstructability of graphs in a given family F, this generally takes two steps. First, there's the rec recognition step. We need to show that every graph with the deck of a graph in this family also lies in the family. And then a part that's called weak, weak reconstruction, namely given that we have the deck of a graph in this family, show that the deck determines which graph we have in this family. So let's think about what that means for trees. So Needle made the conjecture that Trees with at least two L plus one vertices are weakly L reconstructable, meaning that if you know that the deck came from a tree, the deck would determine which tree it is. So we were able to prove that with the same threshold, when N is at least two L plus one, we can recognize whether our deck came from a graph with a cycle or not. So acyclic graphs are L reconstruct re recognizable. But when we know the, L, the N minus L deck, as long as N is bigger than two L plus one, at least two L plus one, we also know the two deck. So we know the number of edges. So that means that with our theorem, uh, there is this exception though, when N is five and L is two, you've seen that counter example, um, that trees with at least two L plus one vertices will now be L reconstructable. 
So that's a conjecture. But there's another exception. Grenland, Johnson, Scott, and Tan in their paper gave this one, diff, this one annoying example. These two graphs have 13 vertices, non-isomorphic, these two trees, they have the same seven deck. I haven't had the time to check that, but in other words, they're saying that these trees are not six reconstructable. So maybe we need another exception. Um, but what did they prove? In their paper, <clears throat> they proved that N vertex trees are reconstructable from their K dex when K is at least about eight ninths of N. So again, if we turn that around and say, what does this say about the relationship between N and N minus L to talk about N L reconstructability, they have proved that trees are L, sorry, L reconstructable when the number of vertices is at least nine L plus something involving square root of L. That's pretty good as a threshold, although we're trying to lower it. Um, we have a, a long detailed result showing that trees are three reconstructable when we have at least 22 vertices. The special case of their result when L equals three covers N being at least 194. Um, but what we proved was only for three reconstructability and it took about 48 pages. So I don't think we're ever going to publish that. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see, I have 10 minutes left. Let me try to tell you uh, some of the ideas in this proof. Now I'll actually only tell you about the ideas needed to prove this when n is at least 2l plus 2, that the n minus l deck of an n vertex graph determines whether the graph has a cycle. <clears throat> we proved it also when n equals 2l plus 1, but that case is about two or three times as long, so it needs other ideas. <clears throat> a k vine is a tree with diameter 2k. So that means you have a center, which we call a K center in the graph, and you have paths in two directions going off with length, length K. And altogether you have a tree. So the idea behind the proof is to find for a suitable K that the deck determines the number of K centers in any reconstruction. But a reconstruction having a cycle is going to have more K centers than a reconstruction without a cycle. Or to put it another way, we will get an upper bound on the number of K centers in an acyclic reconstruction and a lower bound on the number of K centers in a reconstruction that has a cycle. And since those values have to be the same, you get an inequality. And when you simplify that inequality, it tells you that n has to be at most 2l plus 1. Okay, so when n is at least 2l plus 2, you couldn't have both of those reconstructions. Um, so let me be, try to be brief about the lemmas. If you have a graph with growth at least 2, 2k two plus 2, every k vine is going to be contained in a unique maximal K vine. Uh, it's easy, but I'm running out of time, so I won't tell you the details. It's easy to show that. And what that means, if we want to count the K centers in the reconstruction of a graph, all we need to do is count the maximal K vines. So there will be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the K centers and the maximal K vines. And you see this comment about being contained in a unique maximal K vine. That's what we need to apply the counting lemma. So that lemma we just uh, stated <laughs> will enable us to show that the family of K vines is absorbing for the graph that's a reconstruction of our deck 
And so we'd be able to apply the counting lemma to count the maximal ones, meaning that all the end vertex reconstructions will have the same number of case centers, whether it has a cycle or not. Again, this is easy. We have the properties that we need. The girth will be big enough. We have every body uh, contain, every K vine contains a unique maximal ones. And so therefore the family of K vines will be absorbing for any graph that's a reconstruction from this deck. Okay, and so again, we already know that all reconstructions have the same number of K centers. Now, in order for that to make sense, we need, uh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. We're gonna now fix the value of K. This is one less than the minimum radius among all the connected cards in our deck, okay? So that special value, all reconstructions will have the same number of case centers and uh, we need to eliminate the possibility that K is zero. So this again is easy. Um, basically, what, when K is zero, what does it mean? K hat is one means that a card with minimum radius would be a star. It has N minus L vertices but a cycle has to have at least n minus l plus one. So the sum of those two numbers is bigger than n. So they would have to be in the same component. And again, the two deck, we know the number of edges at most n minus one since we have a reconstruction that's a forest. So the cycle, the reconstruction that has a cycle would have to be disconnected. And uh, what that uh, leads us to is an inequality again that says uh, n would have to be at most 2L plus one. So here's this key idea that I'd like to tell you about. The, um, it's called the marking argument. Suppose here's a reconstruction that's a forest. In fact, it's a tree in this case. The red part is a card with minimum radius, okay? The radius is three. And we have three edge disjoint paths that emanate from the center of this card. And the idea is that each case is, so um, all the X's, X1 through X6, are K centers along with Z, meaning you can go distance two in both directions in the tree and, uh, and get a K vine with that vertex as its center. But because we have to be able to go distance K, that means each XI is going to mark a vertex at distance K away from it in the direction away from Z. So how many K centers can you have? Well, you have Z and the neighbors of Z can mark a vertex that's in this card but all the other K centers have to mark a vertex that's outside of the card, okay? But any vertex outside of the card can only be marked by one K center, and therefore the number of K centers other than Z and its neighbors is at most the number of vertices outside the card, and that's L, because our cards have L, N minus L vertices. So this gives us an upper bound on the number of K centers in a reconstruction that's a forest, that's acyclic. It's at most one plus D plus L. And when we have a reconstruction that has a cycle, okay, let, uh, there is this step here. There are two cases. Remember our shortest radius cards have radius K plus one they might have diameter 2K plus one or 2K plus two. So we have two cases to think about. Maybe some connected card has diameter 2K plus one or all of them have 2K plus two. Well, <clears throat> when one of them has diameter 2K plus one, that value of D will be one. We will get, we will get from the marking lemma, the number of K centers in F is at most two plus L. But when we look at a reconstruction that has a cycle, the cycle has to have length 
bigger than the size of a card because all of our cards are acyclic. And every vertex on the cycle is going to be a k-centered. So n minus l plus one is our lower bound on the number of k-centers in H. Two plus l is our upper bound on the number of k-centers in F. If we have both reconstructions, then since they have the same number of k-centers, we have this inequality which simplifies to n being at most 2l plus one. So that excludes this possibility that one of the cards could have diameter 2k plus one. And when they all have 2k plus two, we have a sim similar argument. Again, we come down to an inequality that implies n has to be at most 2l plus one. So again, uh, the slides are available on at the top of my preprint page. So if you want to see more of the details, you can look there or uh, also at the papers that are linked to from that page. Um, let me just mention in the minute or so I have left some open questions. Um, so again, we have this question about trees. Are trees with, oh, can I show the uh, open questions? Nobody is saying anything. Yes, so, yes, um, yes. yes. Okay. This is the last slide. Um, okay. Um, so again, we have this possibility that trees with at least two L plus one vertices are L reconstructible. Although we do have these couple of exceptions and it's known to be true when N is at least nine times L. We think we might be able to lower that to seven L or six L. The same question about connectedness. Will we be able to recognize whether all reconstructions are connected or all reconstructions are not connected when n is at least 2l plus 1? This is still wide open. It's true for l, l equals 3, and we know that the threshold in 10l is big enough. Again, I told you a little bit about regular graphs. So now for other values of d and l, can you show the d regular graphs? are L reconstructable, we know this much. Um, what about bipartite graphs? Very well-behaved class of graphs in many respect. Can you show that bipartite graphs are, just, are too reconstructable? Just a little bit more than what's known about reconstructability. Um, <clears throat> I showed you that complete R-partite graphs are determined by their R plus one deck. Is this always sharp? Um, we know when R equals three that it is because this particular complete tripartite graph has the same three deck as this four-partite graph, complete four-partite graph. So this graph is um, reconstructable from its four deck, but not from its three deck. Can you generalize this construction to larger R? That might be one of the easier questions. Um, needle have this question. So what is the maximum number of vertices such that every vertex, n vertex complete multipartite graph is determined by its k deck? And the value, this value of n is somewhere between k log k and k times two to the k. So there's a huge gap here. Um, that was all Needle showed about it. And, and finally, uh, just very open, what sort of thresholds on N on the number of vertices can you prove to show that your favorite class of graphs or parameter is L reconstructable with, for graphs with at least that many vertices? Connectivity matching number, the chromatic number is one reconstructable, but when N is at least three um, in general. How large a number of vertices do you need to show that it's L reconstructed? So I think the area is very wide open and I encourage people to get interested. <coughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for questions from the participants. Can I, can I read the question in the chat box? 
Ah, I didn't notice there were yeah. the questions in can, chat. Can, can we use reconstruction problem to solve subgraph isomorphism problem? In particular, if we are given a tree and a regular graph G on N vertices, how can we you say T is a spanning tree of G? <clears throat> okay. Um, so the disclaimer that needs to be made always when talking about reconstruction is that we, in the reconstruction problem, we do not care how long it takes to compute anything. Um, in, in particular, in ordinary reconstruction, the number of spanning cycles is reconstructable, okay? But it's NP complete to determine if there is even one spanning cycle. The Hamiltonian cycle problem is NP complete, but we can reconstruct the number of spanning cycles from the deck. Well, it takes a long time to do that, right? So it, it, there's no conception or um, discussion of how long it takes to do anything. So um, if you can reconstruct a graph from its deck or its L deck, uh, yes, that determines the graph and any other graph re uh, not isomorphic to it would not have the same deck. Okay, that's what reconstructable means. So you could tell, you could tell whether two graphs were isomorphic if you knew that their L decks were different. Um, but the time it would to determine the graphs from the L decks is, you know, something exponential in general or worse. And um, so when we have reconstruction, uh, we, we can't re use it to talk about how long it takes to do anything. I hope that answers your the question. So this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it was nice uh, you have used the counting lemma and the Kelly's lemma in your early conception. Yeah, and you have proved that trees are three reconstructable when n is greater than or equal to 22. Uh, yes. Yeah, that... yeah but you have the, is the lower bound sharp, sir? No, I don't, we don't believe so. We believe that all trees uh, with at least seven vertices are three reconstructable. Okay. But what, um, what, what, oh. uh, I, Again, that's the conjecture here, the first con conjecture here, the, except for the pair 5, 2, and maybe 13, 6, that we will be able to uh, show that uh, trees with at least two L plus one vertices are L reconstructable. Okay, so yes, even, even the result we have about L equals three for trees, uh, it's stronger than their result for the special case of their result for L equals three, but even this we do not believe is sharp. One more general question, sir. Uh, that also pointed out in his book. Uh, these present techniques of doing reconstruction of graphs won't settle the reconstruction conjecture completely. Uh, what is your suggestion, sir? Because uh, he said the technique like proved by LOVAS for proving Yeti reconstructability of uh, uh, more than half the class of graphs by using some some sort of monomorphism. Well, I yeah. mean, there are one could have hopes about the reconstructability. For example, um, um, Burkhoff was interested in the four color problem and tried to settle the four color problem by defining a more general concept, the chromatic polynomial. And he was, he hoped that one could determine the chromatic polynomials of planar graphs and thereby show that, that they all had uh, roots, uh, you know, that would enable to, as a special case, 
show that uh, with uh, the value of four, you would have non-zero, right? Four would not be a root. So similarly, with the reconstruction problem, if you could find some way to prove that uh, all graphs are at most n over uh, all graphs are n over two reconstructible or you know uh, reconstruct reconstructable from three quarters of the vertices you, you know the, the subgraphs the decks with three quarters of the vertices if there was some way to make an inductive proof or something like that um, sometimes proving a stronger result makes it easier to get the result you want so that's the sense in which you could get something about the original reconstruction conjecture from studying this more con uh, general problem. Uh, Professor I, Vestor, I'm not yes. suggesting that it will happen that way, but okay. <laughs> you know, okay. that's, that's the principle. Okay, <laughs> Professor you, Vest, uh, yes. there is uh, an another question from participant asking. By geomorphism group, the uh, number of distinct graphs in the K deck will tend to be smaller. Arun, sir, please. I think we are uh, nearing almost time for the next session. Oh, yes. <laughs> sir, Arun, sir, please, sir. Start and see how, how we go. So, um, this is, as I say, a theorem that we proved during the uh, lockdown, the first lockdown in Britain. And um, uh, I think this is one of the best theorems I have approved. So I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, so this is the background. Uh, diagonal groups is the uh, motivation. Uh, you probably don't know what they are, but the things that come up include Latin squares and there are applications to synchronizing automata to generalization of arcs in projective spaces, graph homomorphisms, many other topics in discrete mathematics. So I want to uh, take you through a lot of, I think, interesting parts of discrete mathematics. And uh, I'll just start off and we'll see how we go. So I need to uh, uh, indulge you with a little bit of uh, permutation groups first. This may not be everybody's taste, but uh, so we have a finite set omega and we have G, a group of permutations on omega. That means a subgroup of the symmetric group on omega. And we call the group transitive if you can map any point of omega to any other. So there's no proper, you never get trapped in a proper subset of omega. You can always escape by some element of the group. And a group is primitive if there is no non-trivial partition of omega that is invariant. So it doesn't preserve uh, a partition. It's, um, an imprimitive group would be allowed to map the parts of the partition among themselves, but a, a primitive group will always contain an element which will destroy the partition. And uh, it's been known for a long time, since the 19th century, that many questions about permutation groups can be reduced to the questions about primitive groups. And uh, so we have made enormous strides in understanding permutation groups using this kind of technique. Um, I won't bother to uh, go through the reductions that you use to do that, but uh, we really need to know about primitive permutation groups. And uh, uh, so a curious little bit of history. In 1979, just before the classification of finite simple groups was announced, there was a theorem proved independently by Michael O'Nan and Leonard Scott. They both presented at the same conference in Santa Cruz, and both papers were in the preliminary proceedings, but in the final proceedings, O'Nan's paper had disappeared and only Scott's paper remained. But in fact, uh, um, probably unknown to both of them, almost all of that theorem was already in Jordan's Traité de Substitution from, uh, uh, eight, from the um, 1870s. So uh, uh, that's the part that I'm going to use. So it basically it says that if you have a primitive permutation group, there are four possible types that it might be. And these are known as affine wreath product, diagonal, and almost simple. So diagonal groups, 
from one of these four classes. Uh, so what can we say about these classes? Sorry, find... Peter, for invent intervention. One of yes. the uh, Arun wanted to have uh, in that is uh, you mean to say set partition is invariant means each part is individually invariant under omega. Set partition invariant. You're allowed to permute the parts among themselves any way you like, but you that you must preserve the partition as a whole. Right. Uh, I'll say a lot more about partitions in a moment because this is this is central to the th to what I'm talking about. But uh, so we have these four types: affine groups preserve affine spaces. Wreath products preserve things which I will say more about, called Cartesian structures or Hamming graphs. Diagonal groups are the ones that we're working on, uh, and. Almost simple groups are just a rag bag into which you put everything that doesn't fit into one of the others. So you can't hope for a uniform description of the structures that they act on. So uh, I'm going to talk about this class. Indeed, I'm going to talk much more generally, but we need to think a little about wreath products first. So um, we're going to take... Uh, we're going to throw away the uh, primitivity and all that kind of stuff and just build geometric structures, combinatorial structures from this general class of diagonal groups. And it will include some interesting things that uh, you've probably seen before. So a little background on the history of this. So um, uh, two of my co-authors, Cheryl Prager and Chaba Schneider, uh, have been working on this for some time, and we were at a conference in Shenzhen in China, and uh, Rosemary Bailey and I were there, and they invited us to join the project. Uh, so we agreed, and we started thinking about it. Then, of course, we all went off to different parts of the world, and uh, the thing lagged a little bit. But in 2020, a six-month program on group theory started at the Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge. And the four of us were there and we hoped to bring the project to a conclusion. So the program started in January, but of course in March, uh, the coronavirus arrived, the country was locked down and we were all sent home. So uh, this turned out to be a good thing because uh, we'd almost, uh, decided on what the final theorem was, but uh, the opportunity of sitting at home with nothing else to do made us prove a much, much nicer theorem, which I, is what I want to tell you about. And this is a theorem I'm really pleased about. But uh, let me give you an analogy for the theorem first. And this analogy comes from projective geometry. So in projective geometry, uh, the following occurs. If you have a one-dimensional projective geometry, that's just a projective line. It has no incident structure at all on it. It's just a line, a set of points. You can put structure on it using cross ratio or things like that, but it has no incident structure. A projective plane has points and lines, uh, but there are Projective planes exist in great profusion. There are huge numbers of them, especially in the infinite case. There are free constructions for projective planes. So they're completely wild and there's no hope of a classification. But as soon as the dimension is larger than two, suddenly everything becomes very tightly structured. Uh, you can coordinatize it by an algebraic object, namely a division ring, a possibly non-commutative field. So, this is the way that things look in projective geometry. Uh, and I'm going to give you a similar situation where um, things that come from these diagonal groups, wild profusion, so the things corresponding to the two-dimensional projective geometries will be arbitrary Latin squares. But once you get up to higher dimensions, suddenly a group appears. Uh, out of the combinatorics comes a group and that group coordinatizes the structure. So essentially the only Latin squares that will uh, extend to higher dimensions will be Cayley tables of groups. 
And this is actually a very close analogy. I, uh, so in projective geometry, the crucial thing is Desargues' theorem. A projective plane satisfies Desargues' theorem if and only if it can be coordinatized by a division ring, if and only if it can be embedded in a higher dimensional space. Well, I can show you exactly the theorem that plays the role of Desargues' theorem for Latin squares, and that'll come later on. So I have to tell you what a diagonal group is, but I've set this slide in smaller type because I don't really want you to remember all of this. Uh, this is just to show you what the thing is. Uh, a diagonal group has two parameters, capital T, which is a group, any old group, finite or infinite, and M is a non-negative, a positive integer, which is like a dimension. And uh, so how do we build this diagonal group? Well, it's a group of permutations of, the, of a set omega, and omega is just t to the m, so the set of all m tuples of elements of t. And when I'm thinking of a point of omega, I'll write the m tuple in square brackets, because I also want the group t to the m, the direct product of m copies of t, and I'll represent that in round brackets in the usual way. So what are the permutations that generate the group? Well, the, the kinds that I want you to remember are the first two. You don't have, have to worry about the last ones, but you have the group T to the M acting by right multiplication. So if you know about Cayley graphs, we're going to be building a Cayley graph, basically. This group acts by right multiplication. Uh, so TI acts on the ith coordinate, and you have the direct product of M copies acting on the whole of t to the m. Then you have one more copy of t, which I'll call t0. t0 acts by left multiplication, but simultaneously on all the coordinates at once. So to act with an element of t0, you take an m tuple and you multiply every element on the left by some element of T. Of course, if the group's abelian, this makes no difference, but uh, if it's non-abelian, that will be a different permutation. Now we also take the automorphism group of T acting on the coordinates, permutations of the coordinates, and another rather strange looking element, which I don't want you to worry about. But so these permutations will generate a group. So what I'm saying is this is a very explicit group depending on a, a group T and a dimension M. So given T and M, you can build this diagonal group. So the geometry that I'm going to describe to you uh, is defined in terms of partitions. So I need to bring you up to speed on partitions first. So a partition, you probably know, is a set of non-empty pairwise disjoint subsets of omega whose union is the whole of omega. So you just take omega, you cut it up into parts, pairwise disjoint parts covering the whole set. So that's one way of thinking about it. And of course, as mathematicians know, uh, a partition is the set of equivalence classes of an equivalence relation. And conversely, if you have an equivalence relation, its equivalence classes form a partition. So these amount to the same thing. We can think of the partition as a collection of sets. We can think of it as the equivalence classes of an equivalence relation. And another way, which uh, since uh, one of the four of us, Rosemary, is a statistician, statisticians think of this as the kernel of a function. So you have a function on omega. You don't care where the function maps omega to. But we, what we do care about is take the points in the range of f, take their inverse images, they, that will form a partition of omega. So all the points that map to A is one part of the partition. All the points that map to B is another part and so on. So that's another way of thinking about a partition. So that's what a partition is. Now, we let uh, math bold uh, P of omega be the set of all the partitions of omega. So you just look at the collection of all the set partitions of the set omega. And this is partially ordered by a relation called refinement. So P is below Q, P is less than or equal to Q in this order, 
if every part of P is contained in a part of Q. So in other words, take the partition Q and you're allowed to chop the parts of Q up into smaller parts to produce the partition P. So that's a partial order on the set of partitions. And I should warn you that in some of the literature, people put the order the other way up. We're taking it this way around. So if you think about this partial order, at the very top is the coarsest partition, the one with just a single part containing everything. At the bottom is the finest partition, which is the partition into parts of size one, corresponding to the equivalence relation of equality. So that's the uh, partial order of partitions. And it's more than just a partial order, it's actually a lattice, because if you take any two partitions, P and Q, they have a unique infimum or meet, the greatest lower bound, and a unique supremum or join, a least upper bound. So let's just look at those. Uh, the meet of P and Q is the partition whose parts are, you take every intersection of a part of P with a part of Q. If that intersection happens to be empty, you throw it away because we only want non-empty parts and you take all the non-empty parts and that forms a partition, and that partition is the greatest lower bound of P and Q. The least upper bound is a little harder to describe. This is what you do. You uh, take your two partitions, P and Q, and you make a graph where you take two points, you join them by an edge if they lie in the same part of P or if they lie in the same part of Q. So if you think about walking around in this graph, you're allowed to walk to any point lying in the same part of P as where you started, or to any point lying in the same part of Q. So this graph will have some connected components and those connected components will form a partition and that partition will be the supremum, the least upper bound of P and Q. So we have a lattice of partitions and we'll be interested in sublattices, which are subsets closed under meet and join, but we'll also be interested in join semi-lattices, which means they're closed under join, but possibly not under meet. So finally, the geometry of a diagonal group is going to turn out to be a join semi-lattice, but we need a little bit of background to actually get to that point. So we're going to be working in the partition lattice all the time for the next what, little while. So I hope that's clear. Uh, let's just say, are there any questions about partitions and their partial order before I go on? I don't hear any questions, so let's carry on. Here's an example of a partition. Suppose you have a group well, I said a finite group, but it needn't be finite. Any old group would do. Take a group. For any subgroup, you have a partition into right cosets of that subgroup. This is one of the first things that you learn in a group theory course, that if you take H, multiply all its elements on the right by a fixed element of G, that gives you a coset, and the cosets form a partition of G. So, we, for every subgroup of a group G, we get a coset partition. And if you take two subgroups, we can describe the partial order and the meet and join in terms of the subgroups. PH refines P of K, so it's less than or equal to P of K, if and only if the subgroup H is contained in the subgroup K. The meet of two of the partitions PH and PK is the coset partition of the intersection of P of H and K. So that's the meet. And for the join, the join of PH with PK is the partition corresponding to the group generated by H and K. This is the smallest subgroup containing both H and K. So questions about coset partitions can always be brought back to questions about subgroups of the group. And in particular, from these things, you see that the coset partitions form a sublattice of the partition lattice on G, and it's isomorphic to the subgroup lattice of G. You just map a subgroup H 
to its coset partition, and that gives you an isomorphism. So inside the partition lattice, you can find the lattice of coset partitions of the group. Okay, now structures for wreath products. So uh, uh, what wreath products were one of the types in the um, onan Scott theorem. And Prager and Schneider had spent many years working on these structures. They call them Cartesian decompositions. And that's, they wrote a whole book about it. And I'm not going to tell you what's in the book because different people describe these things in different ways. Graph theorists call them Hamming graphs. And Hamming, of course, was a coding theorist. So this should suggest to you um, that there's some connection with coding theory, as indeed there is. And uh, Philippe Del Sartre, in his very influential PhD thesis, called them Hamming schemes. But all of these definitions lose the order relation, and the order relation will be important. So I'm going to give you a, a reformulation of these things in terms of partitions and their order. So, and I'll call the thing I get a Cartesian lattice. So here we go. We start with the Boolean lattice. The Boolean lattice is the lattice of all subsets of one up to n. So you just take all the subsets. Uh, the partial order is inclusion, meet is intersection, and join is union. So this is a very familiar and well-known lattice. And we want to make a lattice of partitions out of that. And what we do is this. So I said coding theory, so you will be expecting there will be an alphabet of uh, uh, capital A of size bigger than one, but possibly infinite. Uh, and we look at the set of all words of length n over the alphabet A. So that is A to the n, but I'm going to think of it as the set of all words of length n. And in coding theory, you transmit error correcting codes, you transmit a word of length n, and perhaps an error occurs, well, that error changes one coordinate, one letter of the word into something different. And if that happens, we'll regard those words as having distance one. So that's where Hamming distance comes into it. But I'm going to embed the Boolean lattice into a partition lattice on the set omega, on the set of words. So what I do is this. I take any subset of one up to n, capital I say, and for corresponding to that subset, I'm going to give you a partition of omega, which I'll call QI. Uh, so the easiest way to describe it is to give you the equivalence relation corresponding to I. This equivalence relation says that two words, A1 to AN and B1 to BN are equivalent if they agree in every position outside I. So you're allowed to change the entries at positions within I but outside I, things must remain the same. So that gives you a partition uh, of the set, omega, the set of all words, right? So we have, for each subset of one up to n, we have a partition, which I'll call Q sub I. And these partitions form a sublattice of the partition, partition lattice, and this sublattice is isomorphic to the Boolean lattice. So as a lattice, it's just the Boolean lattice. But we have more structure because the lattice consists of partitions. It's a sublattice of the partition lattice. And it's that extra structure of partitions that's important. So we, the, the isomorphism just takes the set I and maps it to the partition Q of I. So if you want to verify that, you have to check that uh, the meet of the partitions QI and QJ is the partition corresponding to I intersection J and the join corresponds to I union J. So this I will call a Cartesian lattice and uh, um, its automorphism group is a certain group called a wreath product and this is one of the groups in that Onan Scott theorem I told you about. The wreath product was the second type, and this is the wreath product that occurs there. So these are wreath product groups. Right, so now um, we're moving towards the uh, diagonal business, but we have to stop and think about Latin squares first. So I hope you've 
met Latin squares in some bit of discrete mathematics before. And you probably think of it like this. A Latin square is a square array of size n by n. So just a, a square, uh, an n by n square with boxes. And these boxes are filled with letters from an alphabet of size n. And the requirement is that each letter should occur once in each row and once in each column. So here's a little example. N is three, so this is a three, an order three Latin square, it's three by three. We have three letters A, B, C in the alphabet, and each letter A occurs once in each row and once in each column. So that's a Latin square in the usual way. But I want you to now think about Latin squares in a rather different way. But first of all, let's just say Latin squares there are huge numbers of them, more than exponentially many in terms of the uh, um, number of cells in the square. They've been classified up to m equals 11, and that was a huge computation. Nobody's gone beyond that yet. Uh, so exactly how many Latin squares there are, we don't know. But I'm going to define them in a different way in terms of partitions. So I'll take omega to be the set of n squared cells in the array. So here, omega has size nine. And there are three partitions. Omega is partitioned into three rows, each of which contains three of the squares. It's partitioned into three columns, each of which contains three squares. And the letters also give you a partition. There's the three squares containing the letter A, the three squares containing the letter B, and the three squares containing the letter C. You remember I told you that one way of thinking about a partition is the kernel of a function. Well, the Latin square in a sense is a function from the set of cells to the alphabet because the function tells you what letter to write in each cell and it's the kernel of that function that is the letter partition. So here's what it looks like in that example. So on the right, I've just taken the cells and I've numbered them so that I can identify them. These numbers only say this is cell number one, cell number two, cell number three, and so on. Here's the original Latin square. The partition into rows, the rows are one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. So those are the three parts of the partition. Similarly, the columns are one, four, seven, two, five, eight, and three, six, nine. And the letters, well, A occurs in positions one, six, and eight. B occurs in positions two, four, and nine, and C in positions three, five, and seven. So those are the three partitions. And if you take those three partitions, add in the partition into sets of size one, that's the corresponds to the equality relation, and the universal partition, the one right up at the top with a single part, then you will get a lattice of partitions, a sub-lattice of the partition lattice. Uh, because if you take R, C, and L, the meat of any two of them is E, and the join of any two is U. So there is a lattice. And in fact, um, if you leave out the letters, so you just have the rows and columns, this is a Cartesian lattice because it's the, uh, um, it's the n equals two Cartesian lattice. Um, and um, indeed, if you have any uh, three partitions so that they form a lattice, but if you leave one of them out, you get a Cartesian lattice, then what you have is precisely a Latin square because if R and C form a Cartesian lattice, L tells you where to put the letters in that Cartesian lattice. So Latin squares, we can recognize by this property that we have three partitions. Any two of them are the minimal non-trivial partitions in a Cartesian lattice. And this could give us a definition of automorphisms. I won't uh, bang on about this too much, but uh, uh, an automorphism would be a permutation fixing rows, columns, and letters setwise. And Latin square people call these things paratopisms, but they're just automorphisms if you think about the squares in this way. Uh, now, there's one interesting case. If you take the Cayley table of a group, capital T, the Cayley table, so 
uh, rows and columns are indexed by T and in row little g and column little h, you put the product gh. So that's a Latin square and it's paratopism, it's automorphism group, it's paratopism group is exactly the diagonal group that we defined earlier, dt2. So the two dimensional diagonal group. And um, this is perhaps not as well known as it ought to be. So now to diagonal semi-lattices. Um, the diagonal group acts on t to the m, and you remember that we have m copies of t acting by right multiplication and uh, an additional factor t is zero acting by simultaneous left multiplication. So I'm going to take all the coset partitions of these m plus one subgroups. So I've got t1 to tm and t0, and they're subgroups of t to the m. So they will have coset partitions. And if you think about the coset partitions corresponding to T1 to Tm, they will just give you the minimal elements in the cut. So you can think of T to the M, that's a set of all words of length M over the alphabet T. It, there'll be a Cartesian lattice there and T1 to Tm will be the minimal non-trivial partitions in the Cartesian lattice. And T0 will be another, will give you another partition which somehow cuts across all of those. And uh, so um, these things, uh, um, so these lie in the diagonal group. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these coset partitions, Q0 to QM, and take the join semi-lattice they generate. In other words, take all joins of subsets of these. Oops. And I'll call that the diagonal semi-lattice. And you can show that the automorphism group of that diagonal semi-lattice is the diagonal group. Um, so here is our main theorem, and this is the theorem that I'm really very excited about. So suppose you have a set omega, you have m plus one partitions of omega, q0, q1 to qm, and suppose that whenever you take any M of those partitions, you find that they are the minimal non-trivial elements in an M-dimensional Cartesian lattice. So we take the Cartesian lattice as, as known, and you say, if you take any M of these partitions, you get a Cartesian lattice. If you take all their joins, you get a Cartesian lattice. Then what happens? Well, if M equals two, uh, we have a Latin square because we have three partitions, any two of them form a two-dimensional Cartesian lattice. And we saw along the way that that's a Latin square and every Latin square arises in this way. So for M equals two, these things are just Latin squares. But if M is greater than or equal to three, by some bit of magic, a group appears, T, such that the joint semi-lattice generated by these partitions is the diagonal semi-lattice and its automorphism group is the diagonal group. So this is the theorem that's the analog of that theorem in projective geometry that I told you earlier on. So for M equals two, we have this chaotic unclassifiable situation of all Latin squares, but for M greater than or equal to three, there's an algebraic structure, a group, which coordinatizes the geometries. So that's the main theorem. Um, time is running away with me, so I haven't really got time to, to even give you a sketch of the proof, or even uh, to tell you, uh, I'll just say that uh, I'll make the slides available, and if you're interested in the result that plays the role of Desargues theorem, it's this theorem of Frolov, uh, involving something called the quadrangle condition, uh, which I won't haven't time to tell you about here. Frolov was not a mathematician, and apparently he knew no group theory, but uh, he managed to prove this theorem, uh, which is a key to our proof. So I want to go to, to graphs now. I want to spend... Uh, there are many other directions you can go from this thing, graphs, projective spaces, all kinds of things. But uh, I want to uh, tell you about uh, something that we call the diagonal graph. So if you take, go back to a Cartesian lattice. So remember the set, the, the vertex set is A to the N. 
And the minimal partitions are the ones where you just fix all the coordinates except one and vary one coordinate. So in other words, two points are joined if they agree in all positions except one. So this is a graph called the Hamming graph, which is very important in coding theory. So two elements of A to the N are joined if they're contained in the same part of a minimal non-trivial partition of the Cartesian lattice. So the Hamming graph comes directly from the Cartesian lattice by looking at the minimal non-trivial partitions. Well, we could do the same with the diagonal semi-lattice. Take the diagonal semi-lattice, join two vertices if they're contained in the same part of a minimal non-trivial partition of the diagonal semi-lattice. So this gives us a nice graph called the diagonal graph. And except in very small cases, you can reconstruct the semi-lattice from the graph, and therefore the automorphism group of the diagonal graph will be the same as the automorphism group of the semi-lattice. Uh, and so this is the diagonal graph. So we know a few things about it. Uh, its automorphism group is the diagonal group. For m equals two, it's what's known as a Latin square graph. This is a very prolific family of strongly regular graphs, if you know about these things. If the group is the cyclic group of order two, we get another well-known graph called the folded cube. So this is a distance transitive graph. And these, that comes up in the case where the group has order two. Uh, the clique number, except in small cases, is equal to the order of T, the order of the group. And the chromatic number is also the order of the group in under some hypotheses. If M is odd, or if the group has odd order, or if the group has non-cyclic Silov subgroups, then the chromatic number is also the order of T. So the group is, the graph is what people sometimes call weakly perfect. Uh, that's not true in the remaining case. And uh, we don't know what the chromatic number is, but okay, so I did promise to get to this point to, uh, to tell VJ something. So VJ, I hope you're listening. Um, so there are two Latin squares of order four. They're the Cayley tables of the two groups of order four, namely the cyclic group and C2 cross C2. So uh, that will give us two two-dimensional um, diagonal semi-lattices or Latin square graphs, if you like. So this is one of the exceptional cases. So in a Latin square, you have cliques corresponding to the rows, cliques corresponding to the columns, and cliques corresponding to the letters. Um, but you can also have cliques of size four, and these come from things called intercalates, which are two by two subsquares. So I've highlighted an intercalate in red here. We have in these four positions, they use two rows and two columns, and they have just two symbols in them. So there is an intercalate in the Cayley table of the cyclic group. And the cyclic, it's easy to see that the cyclic group has only four intercalates. That's the one I've highlighted. You can move it one place left, you can move it one place down, or you can do both. So there are just four intercalates. Um, they're pairwise disjoint, and they meet all the rows, columns, and letters in two structures. So if we want to reconstruct the Latin, the um, uh, diagonal structure, we can't use these intercalates. The cliques we have to use must be rows, columns, or letters, because we need a row and a column, for example, to intersect in one. And we wouldn't be able to do that if we tried to use intercalates. So that means that you, in the case of the cyclic group of order four, we can uniquely reconstruct the diagonal structure and from the graph. And therefore, the automorphism group of the uh, graph is the diagonal group, DC42. And there's a general formula for the order of that group. And it turns out to be 192. The complement of that Latin square graph is a well-known famous graph. It's the Schrickhander graph. Now, right at back at the beginning of the workshop, VJ asked for an explanation. This is not a simple explanation, I grant you, but it is a, an explanation of why the Schrickhander graph has exactly 192 automorphisms. A graph and its complement have the same automorphism group, and the complement is the um, uh, 
this uh, Latin square graph, and we saw that you can uniquely reconstruct the diagonal structure, its automorphism group is the diagonal group. It fails for the other case because the other case has many more interpolates and you can actually build uh, the semi-lattice out of the cliques corresponding to, entirely corresponding to interpolates. And so you get twice as many automorphisms as you expect. Um, so just let me briefly say something about chromatic number because I think this is a, a, a beautiful problem. Um, the chromatic number, uh, what's the chromatic number of this, uh, this graph? Well, um, first thing to say is there's a graph homomorphism, which I won't define here, uh, a map taking edges to edges from the M dimensional to the M minus two dimension. So we can drop the dimension by two by a graph homomorphism. And graph homomorphisms do not increase chromatic number. So you can go down by steps of two. So if M is odd, you can go all the way down to uh, M equals one. And for M equals one, this graph is just a complete graph. So complete graph has chromatic number M, so the same will be true in the diagonal graph. For M equals two, for M even, we can go all the way down to the base case would be M equals two, which is the Cayley table of the group T, the Latin square graph. And if the Cayley table has an orthogonal mate, that'll give you your coloring with the order of T colors, and so the chromatic number will be the order of T. And there's a famous conjecture, the whole page conjecture that was proved, uh, made in 1955, only proved in 2009 using uh, the classification of finite simple groups, that if the order of T is odd or T has non-cyclic CELOC two subgroups, then the Cayley table has an orthogonal mate. So it has a coloring with that many colors. So the chromatic number of the diagonal graph will be the order of T. In other cases, we don't know. It's conjectured to be that you need just two more colors, but this is not known. Now, I'm practically out of time, so let me just tell you, the slides will be available, I hope. So these are the things I would have talked about if I'd had more time. The one-dimensional case, which leads to an interesting number theoretic problem. Then you might say, well, I took M plus one partitions, any M forming a Cartesian, um, lattice. What if I take M plus R? Well, if M is two, so that we're doing Latin squares, this is mutually orthogonal Latin squares. So we're asking about families of mutually orthogonal Latin squares. But for larger values of M, remember that suddenly a group appears and we're working over a group, but there are still very interesting questions uh, about this. So uh, any M plus one partitions will give you a diagonal semi-lattice, which comes from a group. And um, we don't know if all these groups are necessarily isomorphic. So that's an unknown question. Um, and it's false in the case M equals two. There are examples where you can have different groups. Uh, so I will just say, here are some papers that you might be interested in reading. And I'll stop there. So thank you for your attention. Vijay? Vijay, are you there? Vijay, Vijay Kumar? Yes, 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 I'm here. Yeah, uh, please, oh. please. Any questions or comments? Initially, Arun wanted to ask something. Arun, please. Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Professor. Like, uh, there he was telling about uh, the groups acting on partitions. Like, uh, there you... <laughs> You have two kind of actions, right? Like uh, each partition has to be preserved. That's uh, one way of action. And uh, the other way is like uh, parts are allowed to be permuted among them, themselves. Like uh, yes. each part can have same cardinality, so one can map to the other. So there I was wondering which set of partitions yes. we were looking. It's a set of action we were looking at. Um, yes. So uh, it, that's right. If you fix a partition, then you have these, it's, you have these two groups. And the whole group of all the permutations is built out of those by this wreath product construction. So if you specify the group permuting the parts and you specify the group acting on a single part, then the wreath product of those two groups is the largest possible group that you can have fixing the partition. That's correct. 
Aaron, please. Aaron, please. Uh, so I have uh, two more questions. Actually, can you please say more about the stage conjecture regarding the chromatic number thing? Ah, yeah. I'll uh, go back to that the, slide. I'm sorry, uh, I went so fast here, but there was a lot to say. Uh, so, whole page conjecture, particularly. The whole page conjecture. The whole page conjecture. Uh, so Hall and Page said, take the Cayley table of a group T. And you want to know, when does that Cayley table have an orthogonal mate? Well, in fact, you can show, so the following three conditions are easily, uh, well, let me just give you two of them. Two conditions are equivalent. This Cayley table should Maybe have a this orthogonal mate also is uh, this Cayley table should have a transversal or an orthogonal mate. They conjectured okay. that this would hold if and only if either the order of the group is odd or the group has non-cyclic SILOP2 subgroups. Uh, so they conjectured that in 1955. They dealt with a few cases. It's now been completely proved. And if you go to uh, this reference, this, is, this one has actually been published. It was in the Journal of Algebra last year. So that is the proof, uh, well, it, it contains the last step in the proof of the whole page conjecture. The last, all this was done in 2009, but the proof was not published then. So this is the last step in the whole page conjecture is in this paper. It was done by John Bray. Somebody by name Kandan wanted to ask something in the initial. Thank you. Kandan? You are asking something about uh, Cartesian product and Reith product or something? He was put, he oh. was uh, raising a question in the chat box. Okay, uh, please, mm. Vijay, please. Okay, P Peter, I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, you are uh, transforming the problem of 36 office. Suppose you are uh, interested in this 36 offices problem. You know, there yes. are uh, many different uh, uh, solutions that uh, it is not possible. And most recent one is there by Douglas Chinson and others. So do you have any method of solution uh, that non that, that uh, 36 offices problem is not solvable using um, the concepts that you mentioned now? I haven't really thought about that, PJ. I mean, I, I don't know, uh, possibly, but um, I, I can't give you an answer now. Okay, okay. Uh, Peter, one question. Yes. Some, something you were saying about a Hamming graph. Yes. Is it actually the Kelly graph? Because in the Kelly graph also, uh, yes. they are adjacent if and only if they are distinct in one component. That's right. It is a Kelly yeah. graph. It's, in fact, yeah. it's a Kelly graph in many different ways. Yeah. Let just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. let me see. Um, here. Yes. Yeah. So you take. So A can be any, take A to be any group at all. Then yeah. you look, take A to the N and you use this rule. They joined if they differ in one coordinate. That's yes. a Cayley graph. It's a Cayley graph right. for A right. to the N. But then the diagonal graph is also a Cayley graph because oh, it fine. contains T to the M. And mm. so we have here T to the M. So mm. the diagonal graph is also a Cayley graph. So both of these families of graphs are Cayley graphs. Yes. Okay, okay fine. So that's what I Okay, if there are no other questions, let us thank the speaker, Professor Peter Cameron, and I pass it on to the organizers. Ranjani, please. Just a minute, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such a delightful session and giving us a chance to fulfill our potential here. I would also like to thank our professor, Dr. A. Vijay Kumar, who introduced the speaker to us. Thank you, sir. I would like to give few instructions to the paper presenters. So each paper presenter is requested to go through the parallel paper presentation sessions. Each session has got different link either in Zoom or Google Meet Hence, all the participants are requested to join in their own link. 
and also kindly make a note of online platform date of presentation time serial number in the schedule for paper presentation paper presentation um, presenters shall be called in the order mentioned in the schedule so the paper presenters of the session cannot join through the link of any other session so also it will be comfortable and better if the presenters uh, make their presentation through laptop or desktop kindly avoid mobile presentations and the duration for each presentation is 7 minutes and 2 minutes for question and discussion all presenters are requested to stick on the time duration so if a particular presenter is not in position to present at time of call due to technical reasons the next presenter shall be called immediately hence all the presenters in the particular session have to be ready at the time of starting of the session itself paper presenters Uh, shall be assessed shall be assessed on three parameters namely problem review contents and presentation thank you and the next the afternoon session begins at 12:15 sharp the chair person for the it starts by 2:15 sharp yeah ah uh, 2:15 sharp yeah chair person for the afternoon session is professor dr g sedraman and the resource person is professor dr ayman badavi thank you okay let us join by at least 25 or 210 okay 25 okay, okay. okay thank you sir katana bye yeah